and my paper is part of a larger project that we had on looking at the impact of refugee migration on host communities. Uh, and in this case, we look at different factors, uh, labor markets, and uh, it was also in conjunction with Maastricht University, so Melissa and Craig were also involved at some point in, in, in other projects related to this. Uh, but what this paper does is basically we're trying to tell a gender story. We're looking at the impact of hosting refugees on the hosting economy, and particularly looking at the, uh, at the case of Tanzania, and looking at the household level. So we're looking at household, household changes. In this study, um, uh, basically, we'll talk about the, the refugees, um, the, the, the context of the refugees in Tanzania. We had a very good background this morning with Mariam, who presented a paper on the same area. And uh, I'll go over it a little bit, too. Uh, but then we had some background on that. Then I'll talk about the gender impacts. What, what are the mechanisms that we think might be at play here? Then I'll talk to you about the data and, and our results and some of the conclusions. Um, so in this study, what we do then is we focus on the household dynamics, um, on the consequences. So, so basically, the idea was thinking, well, are there, when we look at the, the impacts of hosting refugees, are there any gender impacts? And, and, and we thought, well, no, there, the impacts may not be gender neutral. So we should look more into these. And, and we try to explain the, the channels of how these may have been going on. And um, maybe most of you, probably most of you are very familiar with the setting. We look at the refugees in Tanzania. Uh, we call it the refugee shock because there was a big inflow of refugees into Tanzania in the 1990s, 1993, 1994. There was a major ethnic conflict in Burundi and Rwanda, and over a million refugees abandoned these two countries and moved into Tanzania, specifically to this, um, to this um, part of, of Tanzania, which is Kagera. Uh, one of the things about the conflict is that a lot of people had to move very quickly, and, uh, and, and basically distance was a big determinant of moving into Tanzania. Uh, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of, of the refugee inflows into Tanzania, into the specific, um, into Tanzania, you have here the refugees from Rwanda and Burundi into Tanzania, and you see how in the early 1990, 1992, 1993, there's a big spike of the number of refugees coming into, the, into Tanzania, and that decreases uh, towards uh, the end of the 1990s, uh, and, and, and what we do here, what we do in this paper is we, we have information on the hosting population before the refugees got in and right, like sort of when they were sort of less refugees into the region. Uh, just to give you a sort of a geog geographical sort of perspective of, of, of what we're, what's happening here, as you see, what we're going to look at is at this region of Kagera, which borders Rwanda and Tanzania. Um, and so, or basically, our identification, or the idea, in, in, the, the way in which we're trying to identify these, these, these possible effects is because a lot of the, the, the refugees had to, had to be very close to the border. Uh, there were a lot of logistical and geographical reasons for this to happen, but if you look at the, the dark points, those are um, the refugee camps. Uh, so you see how close they were to the border. Uh, so when we started thinking about the gender impacts, we tried to sort of, like, what would be, what would be channels to which there would be gender impacts of hosting refugees? And one of the ones we thought about was the competition for resources. Um, refugees, in, in some of these environmental literature, so the refugees have been called resource uh, degraders uh, because they, when they got into the camps and nearby the camps, they had to cut trees in order to use the wood for um, shelter. The, the, shelter and cooking and to clear uh, um, space for cultivating uh, crops. So there were some soil, soil erosion, depletion, and uh, pollution of water resources. Um, there was some evidence that refugees in Tanzania use more firewood per person than the locals. Uh, and there were reasons for this. Uh, first, if they, it was, they were less likely to put out fires uh, between meals because of the lack of matches, and also uh, they depended more on dried food. So they had to um, cook longer uh, than what the, the locals had to do. So there are some UNHCR estimates that at the peak of the refugee crisis in Kagera, uh, the camps consume about 1,200 tons of firewood each day. And by 1996, there, there had been a, a substantial space of, 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 of land being partially deforested. We got this uh, from 
up from where it was. But uh, UN, uh, so, so the, what this shows is sort of the green areas and uh, the sort of part that, that are less green, which are the, the one in, in dark. And you see how by 1996, you see sort of uh, that there's been some environmental um, degradation. Um, so in rural Tanzania, it's common for households to collect firewood and to collect water uh, on a frequent basis. So additional time spent on these activities can restrict involvement in other activities, and more, women were more likely to be doing these activities anyway. Uh, just to make sure that we were not sort of, that, 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 that um, th this population really depended on sort of natural um, resources. We look at the dry season and rainy season, if, and if you see um, in 1991, they were highly dependent on natural sources of, um, of water. So the competition for resources was one of the channels we thought of. Uh, there's this, this very anecdotal evidence of people sort of saying that they're they, they had to work longer, they had to spend more time uh, doing certain household chores because um, it, it took them just longer to be able to achieve those. We also thought about the role of ca casual labor, and this comes from a previous work that we had done on looking at the labor market impacts. And, um, and the way we thought about it was there's a big literature on, o on OECD countries, mostly in the, U really the US, looking at the impact of low skill migration on the labor supply of women. And for example, um, Patricia Cortez was looking at how the, the impact of low skill immigration had resulted in more labor supply of high skilled natives. Um, Cortez and Tesada basically found that um, individuals with high enough productivity outside the household, for them was optimal to sort of outsource the household force and increase the time dedicated to employment. And there's been this, this, after this, there's been a couple other papers sort of find, having the same findings. Uh, women that sort of are in a better position to, to be able to use this low skill migration were working more, so their labor supply had increased, but they were also having more kids, and uh, they were also spending less time on household chores, more time with the kids in educational activities. So there's a lot of these findings in, in, in sort of the high income country, but not but we didn't find anything that's sort of the, the low-income country. And in this case, we thought it, it could be a channel that we could explore. Um, in the low-income uh, country perspective or the refugee uh, context, there is a surplus of casual labor. Uh, and reports, for example, suggested that in some areas close to the camp, the wage rate for casual work had decreased um, by 50%. And there was evidence that refugees substituted casual work um, casual local workers. So there was sort of some substitution of um, refugees, of locals for refugees in the casual sector. Uh, some of the local women then could have employed these uh, refugees willing to work for low pay and to help um, their household course, dedicated more time to other activities. Uh, and, and we thought, well, maybe more likely it's going to be women with higher productivity. And we tried to think about ways in which we could measure this. Uh, and one way is sort of lo looking at literacy and math skills. Since this is a rural, er very rural area, obviously we cannot differentiate it between high and low skill in the same way you would do in a high income country. But then in, in, in this context, just basic literacy and math skills could make a difference. So literate women uh, would be less likely to compete with refugees in the labor market. They could maybe probably get more likely a position with an NGO than, than than, than other people. They could take advantage of new work opportunities or use cheaper labor uh, supply represented by refugees to help with the household course. Um, an illiterate, illiterate, illiterate woman would be less likely to take advantage of the presence of, of cheap refugee casual labor, and they would still need to make adjustment to, increase in, um, to the increasing competition for natural resources that was represented by refugees. And uh, sort of the last channel we thought of was uh, in terms of uh, the changing demand. So the, the working in food crops versus cash crops, women typically are responsible for crops that are meant for household consumption, and men are responsible for uh, crops that intended to generate income, so the cash crops. 
So with this change in demand, uh, a, a consequence of the, the refugee shock in Tanzania was that there was an increase in the demand for specific agricultural products. And there was evidence on the international, of international agency increasing the demand for wood and, um, and the price of tree farms. So qualitative evidence has suggested that male members of the household started dedicating more time to these crops that were typically women crops uh, because they were generating cash. So what we're doing here is we, we, we look at this case in Kagera. We use um, the Kagera Health Development Survey, and our identification is basically based on a semi-quasi-natural like, experiment. Um, forced migrants, so we relied on the fact that forced migrants were not evenly distributed across Kagera. Uh, there were natural uh, topographic barriers, logistical decisions, and distance for the country sort of had them be closer to the border, as we saw this morning, Mariam talk about this. Uh, so it's possible to use distance to the camps and to the border to, uh, as an identification strategy. We obviously have not been the only ones who have done this. There's been previous papers who have used different, uh, uh, sort of similar, in the similar vein, um, with little differences, there's the same identification strategy. So we used two rounds of the Kagera Health Development Survey. We, should, we used the 1991. Uh, wave, uh, which was sort of before the refugees came in, and then we used the 2004, which is after, uh, not, not after, but, but then once the refugees had come into the region. Uh, so this data was initially conducted in 51 communities, but individuals were tracked over time, even if they had moved out of the community. Over 90% of the households were tracked, so the, the attrition rate is very low, so that it was a good recontact rate. Uh, in the 2004 round of the survey. So to measure the impact of refugees, basically we use GPA's data for the instance to the refugee camps, uh, and, and then we, we use the inverse as a measure of, of, of intensity, of how in, intense was the presence of refugees. We also sort of uh, me, like weigh, weigh this by the population, um, by the population of each camp, um, and, and, we interact, and we interact this with a time dummy so that we can see sort of what happened after. So we focus on the impact of the shock on three different activities. We look at farming, we look at outside employment, and, we fo and fetching water and, collect and collection of um, firewood as, um, as a measure of household force. In the 1991, they had other measures, but then this was the only one that was sort of tracked in 2004. Uh, so we focus on the likelihood of engaging in these activities and the time dedicated to these activities. Um, just to give you an idea, um, uh, just to sort of think about whether these trends had to do with some sort of pre-shock data, we, we, we look at the impact of refugee shock on the, on the likelihood of engaging and time spent on these tasks in 1991, and we see that there's not, no significance, so this was not correlated with, with Task activities. Um, so if you look at the chair of people engaged in different tasks, you see that in general, when you look at uh, fire and water, the likelihood of women and, and men to be engaged in this activity was not so different, right? But then when, when you look at the 2004, you start seeing bigger differences. So there's a 25 percentage point difference between male and women after uh, in the 2004 wave, but then this is driven mostly by people that had an above medium choke. Um, the, the similar results we find with hours spent uh, per week in different tasks, and this is what we do. We have a sort of a, a model in which we have a household dummy indicating whether the individual had engaged in a given activity, the ones that I mentioned. Uh, we have a time dummy, we have the refugee choke, a female dummy, and uh, we have distance to Burundi, Uganda, and Rwanda's control variables, uh, and then we have many other controls. Uh, and then what we're interested in is this last coefficient, beta coefficient, which is the interaction of being a female, uh, the, the impact of, of refugees, and time, right? Because we want to look at the differences within household what happened with women after the refugee choke? So what we find is that after, uh, women 
if you, so this is sort of the coefficient we're most interested in. We find that women are more likely to be doing farming activities, less likely to be involved in outside employment, and more likely to be doing household chores. So there was definitely a gender impact uh, of the inflow of refugees, with women have, uh, spending more time in farming and household chores. But then, um, uh, yeah, and this, this is just an interpretation, just to um, just give you an idea of the magnitude using the median value of the chalk, the results indicate that um, the presence of refugee led women to be not nine percentage points more likely to engage in farming and fetching water or collecting firewood and 18 percentage points less likely to engage in outside employment than men. Um, we, we find similar results when you look at time, at time allocation, very, like, just basically very similar re results. I have five minutes, but I should be going soon. Um, and again, when we look at, so to put this into context, using the median value of the chalk, an increase of 1.4 and 1.8 hours per week, we find that there's an increase of 1.4 and 1.8 hours per week in time dedicated to farming and fetching water and collecting firewood. Uh, and the equivalent relative decrease in outside employment for women is close to eight hours. So the, 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 once we had the results, we thought, well, but there certainly must be differences when, when you look at sort of differences across women, right? More productive women or, or sort of diff, so certain difference differences across women could make a difference in the results. So we look, at the re we, we look at the results for different skill levels. So we had a division of gender and pre shock literacy level. So uh, we look at literate women, uh, basically um, basic things as reading or doing simple math, um, because we thought maybe they could be benefiting from the additional supply of cheap labor, and, and, and it would be sort of a channel you would think that might be at play here, but, but then it might be confounded on the sort of general results. And when we look at the results by literacy, we find evidence that women, literate women, were more likely to engage in outside work, outside employment, whereas illiterate women were more likely to be doing farming and collecting uh, fire and water. So the results were being driven basically, uh, so, so the, if you separate by skill levels, the, the results were a bit different, a, a bit different. Very similar results when you look at math skills, uh, because we look at whether they can sort of read and, 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 and then we look at the, the, the different math skills, same results. Uh, we look at different results for age groups, and basically we found that the, the people that were 30 or less in 2004 were the ones driving these results. Again, um, with more time spent on farming activities and household chores and less time spent on outside employment. And uh, we, we looked at, at the results for children as well. And in here we found that the, the time dedicated to outside employment was higher for girls. Uh, but then they also had more time dedicated to, to um, to household course. So in summary, our finding, or we find that hosting refugees had different impacts on the time allocation and activity choice for women and men, with women less likely to engage in outside employment and more likely to um, engage in household course. Uh, but the results differed by skill level, which we thought was a very interesting result because we find that literate, literate women are more likely to engage in outside employment in response to the shock, while uh, illiterate women are more likely to be engaging in farming and household chores, basically uh, firewood and fetching water, collecting firewood and fetching water. And as I mentioned, this is part of a larger um, project that we had, and um, any questions, I'm happy to take them at the end.